Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Carl Unegbu. Carl is a lawyer, journalist, and comedy editor. Carl graduated from the University of Miami Law School and studied journalism at Columbia. He is admitted to the New York Bar and has experience as a law clerk at the International Court of Arbitration in Paris. He runs his blog, ocarlslaw.com, and was an editor at comedybeat.com. Carl has hosted the industry forum Comedy Dialogue, a series held in Manhattan's Upper West Side featuring stand-up comedy performances. Carl also works as a reporter in New York City and has his articles been published in World Policy Journal, Reuters Forum Journal, the New York County Lawyer Newspaper and the Gotham Gazette. Carl recently published his second book, Comedy goes to court when people stop laughing and start fighting. So, a very big warm welcome, Carl. Thank you. Glad glad to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And before we dive into all your amazing projects, experiences to date, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast, which is, on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality of the law if you've seen it? I'm not terribly familiar with the show, but I, uh, I know about the show. And I understand um, from the impressions I get that it covers, uh, you know, activities of, uh, I guess, people who practice law, whether at the office or at the courts, you know, that kind of thing. But I am not terribly uh, familiar with that. Well, that doesn't matter. Many of our guests have not seen it or haven't seen it. And with that, we'll move swiftly on and give it a zero. So to begin with, Carl, would you mind telling our listeners a bit about your background and career journey? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I am actually I'm a lawyer in New York City. I am also a journalist. Uh, I trained, uh, I studied journalism uh, formally at an institution. So I am a lawyer and journalist. And these days I am a blogger and um, an author, uh, but uh, my journey to comedy writing uh, sort of began uh, in my days as a student when I uh, initially went to cover a an open mic uh, open mic event in the city, uh, a show that um, I took in and then wrote about the show for a class assignment, and I submitted that and I got very uh, you know good grades for the assignment. It was a very you know, my professor really liked it. Then uh, subsequently, I went back to you know, cover more shows in the city, not for class though, but out of general interest, you know, in the uh, in the art form. But um, so, but that was my exposure to journal, uh, comedy writing uh, until I graduated from journalism, journalism school, and then I went out there to you know be a, a journalist for a while, and then went back to the law. So I kind of straddle both worlds. And it was um, when I uh, went back to the law that some friends, former colleagues approached me about this idea of uh, a comedy news site. Yeah, a news site that covers comedy. Uh, it was called Comedy Beat. So we, um, it, it kind of rekindled my interest in comedy uh, writing. So I, 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 uh, I readily agreed to work with them on that. Um, yeah, on that uh, enterprise, and we began this um, new site. We covered comedy in the city and around the country and, you know, overseas too. And then on the side, we had a blog role where we, we wrote different uh, blogs covering different subjects. In my own case, I uh, made a foray into comedy, you know, talking about law and comedians, you know. So that was the, the focus of that blog that I was writing. And then, uh, you know, I got lots of feedback from readers. You know, they were so excited about just how refreshing and how uh, it was such a breath of fresh air. They had been, you know, dying to, literally dying to come across that kind of writing because usually the blogs they saw either talked about the law, you know, from entertainment lawyers just writing about the law, or it was just about people writing about comedy, just making commentaries on comedy, but nothing that brought the two worlds together to run in the same stream. So that was where I came in, in that intersection. And, you know, people were fascinated that there could be a blog that, like, writes about the law in a way that was so accessible to them. 
you know, the sort of language they could find, not from the lawyer, lawyers who were writing about entertainment law, which was loaded with, um, you know, which was riddled with um, legal jargons and legal citations and all that. You know, the sort of things that lawyers obsess about that causes lawyers to simply mostly just speak to other lawyers instead of the general public. So the public, the readers were fascinated that, you know, somebody could write in such easy read, accessible language, you know, sort of like what they could have seen uh, in People's Magazine or, or the world famous uh, page six of the New York Post, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then long story short, ultimately the blog led to the book. And the book itself, comedy goes to court when people stop laughing and start fighting. So the book itself, um, it contains perhaps maybe 20% or so of the sort of uh, the contents that I had on the blog, you know, talking about the law and comedy. So, you know, that's how um, the journey um, evolved to this point. I want to ask, you know, another question around, you know, seeing in the news comedians' behaviours resulting them in trouble and ultimately expensive lawsuits. What are some of the legal implications of this? Well, um, the thing is, um, if you live in America, for instance, um, you can practice comedy to a very extensive, uh, you know, you, there's a lot of breadth and depth to how far you can go to swing your arms freely, um, you know, widely uh, and say, all sorts of things, even things that are very offensive to people in this country, because of the First Amendment, you are still allowed to say those things, to, to be as offensive, to be as edgy, you know, as rule breaking as you want to be. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, leeway, room for, you know, uh, an, in a, like uh, an aggressive comedian to really, you know, let it rip until you get to the line which is drawn at. Um, uh, incitement. You don't. There is no right to uh -huh, engage in speech that incites people to violence. You know there is no first amendment protection for that sort of speech, or speech that they call fighting words. You know words that could uh, provoke imminent, a negative reaction, and it may be physical attack you know, from the person to whom it's addressed, and obviously uh, things like obscenity. You know there is no first amendment value to obscenity. So if um, if your material is obscene, then the First Amendment will not, you know, would not protect you. So, but beyond that, I mean, that's a very high bar. So you, ha you have a long distance to travel before you actually, you know, get to the red lines. So comedians have a lot of room for maneuver, in this country at least. If you're a comedian and you commit acts of assault or barry on people, then the First Amendment doesn't protect you against those kinds of physical acts. It may protect you against uh, words words you utter on stage, but not those kinds of physical actions that, you know, violate other post rights. So, yeah. Uh, you know, so that's sort of like the, situ the kind of situation where, you know, you can't uh, rely on the First Amendment. A comedian could get in trouble uh, for what he does. Then again, now, the other case I cover concerns a situation where a comedian then um, was put in trouble by the negligence of the venue. Like this comedian, George Wallace, that I have in the book where he was performing, uh, he had a residency, a residency at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. And then, um, so one time he was performing at an event and then he tripped over a wire and fell and injured, you know, his Achilles heel. And you know, he got seriously injured, which took him out of work for a while. Well, he turns around and sues uh, the venue and the venue obviously was negligent because you know, they were liable because, you know, it was um, foreseeable. Again, we come back to foreseeability. If the damage is foreseeable, then the venue would be liable. So in the, in the Andy Dick case, it wasn't foreseeable that he could suddenly behave in that way, you know, to a fan just taking in a show. But in the other case with George Wallace, it was very foreseeable that unless you, you know, you clear, you keep the, place clear of wires and other things that people could trip on that you know unless you do that if people actually trip on those things they could get injured so that kind of injury was foreseeable so those are the two extremes where in one case it was foreseeable and the venue was liable in the other case the act wasn't foreseeable and the venue wasn't liable now people have asked me 
Well, what if a comedian just finishes a show and then he got mugged in the parking lot while walking to his car to leave the venue? Well, obviously, if he got mugged, it's a security problem. And the venue would be liable in that instance because, you know, again, um, people who are lawfully on your premises, lawfully invitees and other folks with legitimate business on your premises, they are entitled to protection from every foreseeable injury that could happen. So if they get mugged in your parking lot while trying to, you know, go in, get into their car and drive off, then, you know, the basis of liability in that case is obvious. It was foreseeable. And uh, if nothing was done to eliminate that danger, then liability attaches. So those are some of the cases I get to. Yeah, I just love these sort of like breadth of, of, of cases that you cover and very interesting stories. And, you know, it's slightly different for us on, on, on the show because we haven't really got into the world of comedy too much before. And, and like you say, there's quite a lot to unpack. And I guess coming at it from a, a legal perspective, again, how are the interactions of comedians with lawsuits different from experiences with lawsuits, say, with other entertainers, actors or magicians, say? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think, um, see, comedians are a different uh, uh, sort of community. Um, actors are different in the sense that um, you, you can't really know the law pertaining to comedians from simply knowing the law pertaining to entertainer, entertainers more broadly because comedy is sort of unique in itself because fundamentally comedians work alone unlike actors musicians who work in groups and you know they if you're producing a movie for instance it takes a while before the movie uh, airs, before the movie is released, I mean there's a long gestation period from production of the movie, you know, the shooting of the thing and all the editing and other sorts of uh, functions that go into creating a movie. Now, they work in group, they have a longer gestation period and they have teams of lawyers literally looking over the product, handling things like defamation concerns, handling things like uh, privacy rights, licensing for, you know, publicity rights, you know, so those kinds of things. So they have lawyers coming through so much, so much of the work. Well, like I said, comedians work alone, and they don't they they don't have the luxury to have a lawyer looking over their shoulders, trying to like prevent them from saying something that could be perceived as a defamatory or invasive of somebody's privacy rights. So uh, right there, it's a whole other game when you deal with comedians so i mean if some if something is funny they'll go there they don't want lawyers telling them you know you can't say this you can because lawyers to them are sort of like you know uh kill joys if you if you will <laughs> kill joys if you will so so they can they, there is no there is not that kind of luxury so those that is the fundamental difference between a comedian and the way comedians work and the way other uh, people work, entertainers who work in groups with longer gestation periods for their products. So, yeah, there is this role of lawyers, which, you know, is different in, in each case, in each case. In the first, in the other case with the uh, folks who work in groups, lawyers are in on the ground floor from, from, the, from, from the very get-go. From the very get-go, lawyers are there working with them, you know, doing troubleshooting. With comedians, no, a lot of times the nature of their work, their creative process uh, doesn't allow for lawyers to be part of the team. Uh, a lot of times lawyers get involved um, later on down the road, especially when the trouble has arisen. <laughs> when the trouble has arisen, unlike in the other situation with movies and musicians and things where, you know, the collaborative, uh, uh, collaborative, um, art forms where you know um, lawyers do a lot of troubleshooting before the product is even released to the public so there is that uh, distinction there with respect to the role of lawyers uh, in the process so um, that creates a real dividing line but um, so the things they do and the things comedians do you know are different and uh, fundamentally because like I said you know there's just that situation that comedians work alone and they can't have lawyers just uh, looking over their shoulders. 
Yeah, no, it's a very, a very good point, isn't it? You know, it is a, a sort of solo profession, if you like. And uh, yeah, maybe they don't have all of that, um, you know, infrastructure support and teams looking out for them. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of them perhaps, you know, get a little bit lonely as well at times. Today's episode of the Legally Speaking podcast is brought to you by our wonderful sponsor, Clio, the leader in cloud-based legal technology, transforming how law firms operate. If you're a solicitor or managing a law firm, you know how crucial efficiency is. That's where Clio comes in. Clio's comprehensive cloud-based software streamlines your entire practice from client onboarding to case management, billing, and payments. With Clio, you can access your files securely from anywhere, collaborate with your team in real time, and manage your calendar seamlessly. No more missed deadlines, no more lost documents, and a billing process that's as easy as clicking a button. By moving to the cloud with Clio, other law firms have reported 20 plus additional billable hours per month and a 50% boost in revenue. That's more time to focus on what truly matters, serving your clients and growing your practice. Join the over 150,000 legal professionals who trust Clio to make their firms more efficient and productive. Ready to transform your practice? Visit clio.com forward slash UK to learn more and start your free trial today. Now back to the show. I want to talk about the First Amendment because some of our listeners listening all around the world may not be familiar. So, you know, can you explain what the First Amendment is, which you referenced earlier, and how can this First Amendment protect comedians particularly? Yeah, thank you for bringing up the First Amendment. I uh, get into that a lot in the second chapter that covers free speech. And uh, the First Amendment makes a huge, a huge difference in terms of um, where somebody would rather be a comedian. Is it America or is it in Britain or Australia or some other place as well? You know, the First Amendment uh, makes a huge intervention in, ta- in that question. Now, the whole point be- behind the First Amendment is, um, you know, the whole idea of uh, free, being able to express yourself freely. And the, the courts have said that the First Amendment, the, the principle behind the First Amendment is that conversations about matters of public policy should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, quote and unquote. So that's like the defining uh, principle there, uninhibited, robust, and wide open, which means that um, it's not even enough that what somebody has said about a public official or a public figure is not true. It may not be true, but it still doesn't mean that you, go, you become liable for defamation in America. Unlike Britain, if you say something that is false, if you make a false statement of fact, whether you did it negligently or intentionally, you know, it could uh, render you liable for defamation. It's like that in Canada too and other places. In this country, in the United States, no. You have to actually show that the person um, had malice, what they call actual malice. That's the standard. It was established in 1964 in a case involving uh, the New York Times. So, yes, yeah, so since then, you know, the standard in this country for liability for defamation uh, when it comes to public figures and public affairs and that kind of stuff. Is actual malice, which means you have to show that the person made that false statement of fact intentionally, knowing it was false, with an intent to hurt and wound. In other words, you know, if it is so intentional that you knew that it was a lie and you did it anyway, then the First Amendment doesn't protect that kind of bad faith behavior. Or if you did that recklessly, in other words, you knew that there was a strong probability that this thing it's probably false, but you said it anyway, in a reckless spirit. It's sort of like somebody's trying to point point you to something that exists, and you're not you're looking away. That kind of thing. So that kind of reckless disregard for the truth could get you in trouble. So the standard is very high. There are lawsuits that you could win in other countries that you cannot win here. For instance, you probably know a guy. Well, I don't know how much you follow comedy in your country, but. Most British uh, audiences will know a guy named Frankie Boyle, a comedian, Frankie Boyle, right? Very acerbic and you know, controversial guy. So he st- one time he sued at the Daily Mirror. I think it was in 2011 for defamation that they called him a racist and things. Well, ultimately, the Daily Mirror tried to come up with this defense that would have been more appropriate in an American courtroom rather than a British courtroom. 
they were saying something about, well, you know, it's a public, uh, it's a matter of public interest, you know, his racial, his racist behavior, things of that. And, you know, they suggested that he got fired from a show, I think Mock the Week or something, and then trauma door nights because of uh, his racist behavior and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, ultimately the court ended up saying no, and then uh, the court said, well, no, actually, um, just because uh, he was saying those things doesn't mean that he was racist. That was just an art form, you know, what he was doing uh, in his art, different from, you know, um, what he is in person. So the court, the court concluded that, no, he wasn't in fact racist. And then they find the Daily Mirror, big, you know, big money, many, you know, like maybe about 60,000 pounds or something, about 50 or so thousand pounds in damages for defamation because it ended up just being a false statement of fact. Now, if that would have been in an American court, for instance, it would have been that much, it would have been so much harder for the comedian to win because the First Amendment brings in this talk about actual malice. Just because, you know, it may not be true in all respects, again, it doesn't mean uh, that he, they become liable for defamation. In other words, they have to be intentionally, inten they have to intentionally mean uh -huh, that he was right. So yeah, so the actual malice standard, which is the First Amendment uh, thing, would have made it more difficult for the comedian who was a public figure to prevail. And then it was also a discussion about the public interest, you know, matters of racism and, uh, you know, relations between communities in any society. So yeah, it, it would have made a big difference in that case. And, you know, I, uh, if I had to, if I had to um, opine as to where that case would have gone, I would have said that it would have been the reverse of what happened in Britain. You know, that case would have been lost. And frankly, because of this consideration, he probably wouldn't have, the comedian probably wouldn't even, even have brought the suit in the first place against the media house because of the First Amendment, because, you know, the, the huddle, the huddle on the path of winning that case is so high, sky high, that, you know, a lot of times that consideration becomes a disincentive to even launching that kind of lawsuit in the first place. But in Britain, where there is no First Amendment, once you say it and it's not true and it happens to be a false statement of fact that damages somebody's reputation, you're in for it, you go down for it. Same thing in Australia, same thing in Canada and other places. So, you know, the First Amendment makes a huge difference here. The comedian Jay Leno, one other case I have in this book, where he was talking about Mitt Romney, the presidential candidate in 2012. He was comparing, uh, he was making uh, a reference to how wealthy some of them were. So he was comparing Mitt Romney's uh, vacation home in New Hampshire to the Golden Temple in Amritsar, India. That was such uh, a temple of such uh, spiritual significance to the Sikh community in India. So some Indian American law, some Indian American here sued him for racism, for you know insulting uh, the Sikh religion and the Indian uh, country, Indian nation generally. Uh, so he sued Jay Leno, and then the Indian Foreign Affairs Ministry contacted the U.S. State Department to lodge a formal protest. And then the State Department told him, "Well, you know, look, you know, this is America. The First Amendment allows him to say that kind of thing. We don't endorse what he said, but." There is nothing we can do to him. So I guess I bring this up because there are situations where foreign countries could like, the government could sanction somebody for what they said that you could never have in this country. And there are no um, official bodies here that could punish a comedian for, you know, what he said, like what happened in Canada or, you know, the situation in Germany or with the thing between the Indian government and the State Department. So the comedy in this country is different like that. There are so many things you could do in other places that could get you in trouble, but if you did them here, it's nothing. Nobody would even think to sanction you or put any kind of uh, penalty on you. So, so yeah, so the First Amendment makes a huge, a huge difference here in terms of uh, what a comedian can do or cannot do. Yeah, no, and thank you for giving, you know, some, some context around that and, and some art and um, some, some interesting examples. Um, I want to, before we, we finish up, talk a little bit about AI, because you talk about in your blog, ocarslaw.com, um, 
in one particular article, Sarah Silverman sues ChatGPT's owner. Should comedians be worried about AI? You explore the challenges AI is presenting in society and for comedians. In the legal sector, some lawyers are wondering whether technology and AI will replace their jobs. Is AI a threat to the careers of comedians? What do you think? Yeah, well, uh, AI is obviously a big problem, but I have to say that comedians will be the last group of people uh, to be given the hook by AI um, as things evolve, because comedy is sort of like very personalized. And there is a new um, a genre of comedy that has become uh, sort of prevalent today observational comedy where people relate their experiences so a lot of times if it's not coming from the person with the experience it, it wouldn't be authentic the authenticity factor uh oftentimes you know would be missing in such a situation it's like well you cannot if you're george carlin oh, well, it's very interesting because we have a, a, a situation now where george carlin you know his uh, family you know they are like uh suing some AI company, you know, over claimed, you know, uh, misappropriation of his likeness and things. But it, well, that's a separate thing. But the thing is, um, comedy is the last, um, I guess, they, they will be the last people standing when it comes to AI taking down, you know, um, people who deliver personal services. You know, um, maybe actors could be taken down first, but, you know, comedians, even lawyers will be taken down first before comedians. So comedians, their job is more personalized that, you know, if somebody else is doing it or some AI uh, creation is doing the thing, it wouldn't be that authentic. Unless you tell people ahead of time that this is what they are coming to see. Well, then you lose the surprise factor and then, you know, it wouldn't be the same uh, again. So, but, you know, um, can AI try? Of course, AI would try, but I don't see how you can displace comedians um, with that kind of thing because the relationship between comedians and their audiences, again, is also sort of personal. You know, you people like um, people that build a relationship with their you know favorite uh, comedy stars and um, that kind of thing. It's hard to replicate that kind of uh, dynamic, you know, by some AI uh, intervention. So. Um, yeah, I would. I wouldn't worry so much about AI if I were a comedian. A lot of times, um, when, when a comedian sues them, the idea is that um, AI maybe they are like pirating the work of a comedian. Maybe, um, yeah. But you know, that's a different thing from like AI displacing a comedian. You know, like taking away their jobs. Like actors, actors were worried at some point that you know AI could be used to. Um, you know, take away their jobs and displace them. You know, you can't exactly displace comedians because of the personalized nature and the observational nature of what they say. I mean, only George Carlin could relate what happened to George Carlin. It's hard to come across to the audiences in the same way if you're using some AI, you know, model or some product uh, to do the same thing. So, yeah. Um, well, with respect to lawyers, I mean, I can tell you that there are some legal aspects of operations that could easily be displaced with AI. There are some repetitive tasks that you could find in a, what they call legal discovery. You know, people make a discovery request. They are looking for documents and you could like uh, have AI sift through, you know, the universe of documents. And, you know, there might be markers that could indicate uh, things to be segregated. So yeah, I mean, it's easier for AI to do things like that. But when it comes to more creative aspects of the law, litigation and things, I don't see how AI could, um, do an effective cross-examination or, you know, do a fine closing statement. AI hey, could not get things like that. But so those are higher order functions. But the lower order functions that, that are replicable by machines and other uh, devices of that nature, yeah, it could happen. I can see that happening. But if you're a lawyer who is into the more creative aspects of things, then AI is not, is not going to come that far. We watch this space because, you know, ultimately... 
you know, it's going to be a exciting time for AI in the right hands used in the right ways. Um, but I think your point on comedians in terms of, you know, that human to human connection and that authenticity point, um, I absolutely understand. And, you know, you don't want to lose that through AI. AI. I mean, Carl, I've loved learning about your stories and um, your book and what you're getting up to. It's been a fascinating discussion. Um, before we finish up, what would be just one piece of advice you would give for aspiring lawyers as well as aspiring comedians? First, for aspiring lawyers, um, if you want to practice in this area, there is uh, is a growth area. Comedy has become, you know, big today. I mean, it's not a generation ago. If you wanted to be a comedian, your parents would probably discourage you. They might tell you to get a job where you actually get paid. They might tell you to go become a lawyer, a doctor, a school teacher, or something else. But today, comedy has come a long way. It's not a thing in itself, a career option that could lead to a lot of money and fame if you succeed at it, like all other careers. So, so it has become a big thing. And then comedians today have become like rock stars when it comes to audiences. I mean, this have you know sold out shows at what I call arena comedy you know in in London for instance there's the O2 arena here we have the Madison Square Garden there is the there is the Mohegan so I mean these are venues that used to be the exclusive preserve of rock stars today comedians could command uh -huh, that kind of um, attention and with that the money so and then comedians now have a lot of lawsuits that have become a cost of doing business in their careers, which is what this book is about. And this is a phenomenon that has been in place since uh, since the 19, since uh, about 15, 25 years ago, since 2000, let's say 2000 until now. So, um, so it has become a, a growth area, so to speak, a, an area that can support a full busy practice, busy lucrative practice. Uh, so they get sued a lot because they've become the new, um, the shiny new object today, especially in a place like America, but in other societies too. So for a lawyer, aspiring lawyer, if you like entertainment law and those kinds of subjects, yeah, this would be a wonderful area to consider because there is a lot of work. There is a lot of work in this area. Now, for comedians, what would they, if you are a new comedian, um, yeah, first of all, you want to read this book to at least get a sense of um, how you can uh, structure your deals and, you know, a sense of what you can or cannot say and how you can protect your material, which is so crucial to um, your survival uh, in your profession. So, yeah, so these are the things that would be uh, necessary to consider. I mean, like, I, I mean, really, 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 this book is a must read for comedians in that way. Uh, as some observers have described. And um, I chose to illustrate this book with the life stories of so many of the uh, famous comics that people can relate to, whether it is Jerry Seinfeld or, you know, John Oliver or, you know, Jimmy Kimmel, Jay Leno, Michael Shea, you know, Howard Stern. You just name it. It's like everybody is here with their story on free speech and other sorts of things. And, you know, one of the reviewers one time said uh, that if your name is not in this book, that somehow you may not be important in comedy. I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but, you know, uh, maybe if you're, if you're not covered in this book, you've been so lucky so far not to have been uh, sued uh, in this um, all-encompassing phenomenon of uh, comedians getting sued so much. So, I mean, it's a lawsuit culture. It's a lawsuit culture. That has arisen and lawsuits have become a cost of doing business in comedy so if you wish to you know protect yourself your material and all that stuff yeah you probably want to be abreast of the legal uh, situation with respect to what is possible and what is not allowed so yeah so for comedians and for lawyers yeah um like i said it's a 360 degree coverage this book uh for um 
comedians, like a cradle, a cradle to grave, you know, kind of coverage. Yeah, and I think it's a must. It is an interesting book for people to definitely sort of check out and and get some really great insights from. And if people want to learn more about your general career journey or indeed ocalslaw.com, um, where are the best places for them to find out more? Also, what are some of your best sort of social media handles, websites? We'll also make sure we share them with this episode for you too. Yeah, so um, obviously, um, they can go on my blog, um, ocalslaw.com. Um, from, I mean, from what I said, the blog inspired this book. And this book, if you like the sorts of stuff this book covers, then there is more of that on the blog. Like I said earlier, this book has only like 20% at most of the sort of stuff that are on the blog. So the blog is like, it gives you a welter of information on these kinds of subjects. I mean, it's such a, um, it's a place to really have a field day, reading all these stories about comedians and their adventures and misadventures and what the law does to them and all that stuff. So, I mean, um, and it's written part of to entertain people, to give them a sense that maybe um, they are in a comedy club watching a show or watching a comedy roast on Comedy Central. Yeah, so this book can sort of give them that impression uh, you know, make them feel that way. If they don't want to go to an actual comedy club, these stories here are so titillating and fascinating that, you know, it could make them feel that way. It's a good vacation read or something you could read on a couch or, you know, places where you hang out. So, yeah. So the blog and then the Facebook post and the LinkedIn, you know, you can just, uh, we can put it in the chat, but yeah. But the most um, obvious place is the blog. And on the blog, you can learn more about other places where you could find uh, my material. So ocalslaw.com um, will be the place to start. And of course, you know, this book is available on Amazon and uh, at your local bookstore. So all you have to do is ask for it. And uh, yeah, it's all yours. But um, the, book was written, the book was written as a service to the industry, also as an entertainment uh, sort of product. And I hope people will... Um, take the book in that spirit to entertain them and then to learn about the law as well. And, and I'm sure they will. And it was a, you know, fascinating discussion, learning more about your, your stories and, and what comedians are getting up to. So I just want to say thank you so much, Carl. Um, it's really a real pleasure having you on the show, wishing you lots of continued success with your career and future pursuits. But for now, from all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast, over and out. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like the content here, why not check out our world-leading content and collaboration hub, the Legally Speaking Club, over on Discord. Go to our website, www.legallyspeakingpodcast.com for the link to join our community there. Over and out.